another episode of the Environment in Canada podcast, a podcast about the environment in Canada by Sierra Club Canada. I'm Connor Curtis, Head of Communications with Sierra Club Canada, and today I'm going to be talking with Talia, an Urban Agriculture Coordinator with the Milton Park Citizens Committee in Montreal, about collective gardens and urban agriculture, all the benefits they bring and the challenges they face in feeding communities, the impact climate change is having on urban agriculture, and particularly the impact of wildfire smoke on people's ability to get outside, and how you can get involved, whether you live in Montreal, where this garden is located, or want to help in setting up one locally where you are. Before we begin, just a reminder that you can take action on environmental issues by visiting sierraclub.ca. We have tons of petitions, other actions and events, and regular news updates you can sign up for on the homepage. You can also find Sierra Club Canada on social media, and you can listen to the Environment in Canada podcast on the Harbinger Media Network, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast also airs on CKUT Broadcast Radio in Montreal, 90.3 FM, bi-weekly on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. ET. Don't don't forget to click follow or subscribe so you get the latest episodes from us. Hi, Tal. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, Connor. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. I've never been on a podcast before, so this I've, is... This is... <laughs> I, I'm pretty new to it myself in a lot of ways. Well, sort of, you know, like I've done it in the past, but never on this scale. So this is this is new for me, too. Yeah, for those tuning in, who are you and what are you doing with regards to this, this community garden that's that's happening in Milton Park? Yeah, I'm Talia. I'm a Montrealer. And I've been working in the Milton Park community, which is also kind of known as the McGill Ghetto. So within the McGill, a lot of McGill like students that live there for the past four years, working with an organization called the Milton Park Citizens Committee mm. um, as their urban agriculture coordinator. And I started working for them to do garden and gardening activities on their like a very small little green rooftop that they on a building that they had acquired in 2021 and then made some connections with nearby a like next door apartment complex to make a garden in their kind of vacant grassy lawn and so I've been working on that garden now for two summers and we just got the go ahead to do our third summer our third season gardening at that spot as well. So yeah, I, I help coordinate the collective gardens and, and lead like workshops and activities. And it's a pretty big garden. Like it's for Montreal standards, it's it's quite, yeah. uh, quite sizable. I guess, I guess it depends on the perspective. I think it's pretty big, especially because for those who are tuning in from elsewhere, like the McGill Ghetto or Milton Park is right downtown. So there's yeah. not a ton of green space or like open, unused green space. The garden's about like 30 by 40 feet. I can't convert that into meters, but, you know, it's that I think is actually produces a, a lot of food for such a small size. I mean, I plant really intensively, sometimes to a detriment. Um, so but we do get like a, a pretty abundant amount of food. So I think it's pretty big. But, you know, if you even go a little bit into the suburbs, there's like some community gardens that are like triple that size even. Right. Yeah. But for, for downtown standards, it's like probably the largest collective garden and also maybe even one of the only collective gardens that is in the area. I was going to say, I, I do a lot of walking around downtown. I've never seen anything, you know, but it's also and I, I wonder about this because it, it is kind of tucked in a corner, right? Like it's in this kind of semi alleyway space. And so if you're walking past, you you may not necessarily know for, for a fact that it's there. It, it does lend this question to, I'm always curious, oh, was I going to find like, if I keep walking down alleyways, will I find like a bunch of these? But I, I haven't to this day. And I walk down a lot of alleyways. So absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of a secret gem. And even there's people who like live the next street over who just don't, it's not like a super pedestrian heavy tra traffic street the street that the garden's on, it's like one over from a super pedestrian heavy street. So a lot of people who live in the neighborhood will just stumble across it for the first time after like two years and be totally shocked that there's been this kind of green oasis there. And yeah, they, or some people even just walk straight by it sometimes because you just like have like tunnel vision for your destination. 
there are like some community gardens and I know there's a, there's a pretty big one in the like East Plateau is probably like a 40 minute walk, 45 minute walk away. Mm-hmm. But I I actually am part of like a kind of committee of fellow gardeners that are working in the like grander plateau neighborhood in in Montreal. And I, I do think that our collective garden might be one of the biggest out of out of those, which is kind of cool. <laughs> Well, and I'm just thinking too, because it, it's not just the size, but, you know, having been passed a couple of times and having had some of the food out of the garden, it's high quality, you know, like it seems like there's a lot of good like stuff being grown and it's useful, you know, like there's always a lot of like peas and vegetables and things that, and Montreal isn't actually that bad as a city for getting high quality vegetables, but it's still like really lovely that there's something being grown in the city that's actually of a, of a decent quality and, uh, and that's quite tasty. yeah and yeah, it's totally. tasty yeah yeah i did i do try to like prioritize food in the garden that like produces a lot per square foot and that also produces for the entire season so we don't do a lot of brassicas cruciferous like broccolis or cabbages or cauliflowers because they're mm-hmm. also kind of tricky to grow like they have like very sh- strict temperature windows that they enjoy growing in Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we grow like a lot of like tomatoes and eggplants and beans and, and those crops just produce so much. And especially the beans, the beans are always like a real fun because yeah, people are always shocked and yeah, it's good quality. It's yeah, always really delicious. Well, and I guess that ties into the next question that I wanted to ask you, which was around like, what have been some of the benefits for the community and you say this sort of Milton Park you're working for the Milton Park Citizens Committee so there's a bit of a tie into other projects but I'm just curious what are the sort of the general benefits for the community of a garden like this or this garden in particular that you're seeing that's such a good question honestly there's so many and I mean having access to food is like probably one of the most obvious ones but I always also try and make that in my mind at least the least important of the benefits Mm -hmm. because especially last year like there was a lot of forest fires the sea like the conditions of the season of the growing the growing conditions last season weren't the best like there was a lot of smoke and I think we still had like a very productive season but I always try and remove the pressure from having like the output of food even though that is a huge like benefit to the community Mm -hmm. um say like folks tell me that some folks who live alone tell me that they almost completely subsidize their like their their produce for the summer with the garden so they they basically mm. hardly go to the supermarket for their produce and then i'd say like on average we probably are able to subsidize about 30 percent of people's produce needs for like the summer months which is still fairly significant because we have about 30 like fi- i'd say like 15 to 30 people that come each session each mm-hmm. each session i guess i couldn't maybe do a quick explanation of how the garden works and yeah totally yeah yeah that would be good to know for yeah Yeah. the main difference between a collective garden and a community garden is that a community garden each person gardens individually on their own plot Mm -hmm. um, and typically a plot's like 10 feet by 10 feet or so and because of that there's normally in the city very long wait lists at least in montreal in order to get a plot and yeah they're 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 hard to access A collective garden, the idea is that everyone gardens together and then basically shares the space and shares the harvest. So uh, the way our collective garden has worked is that on Saturdays, we have like a collective gardening session. So every Saturday, a certain time we meet, we will do like gardening tasks, harvesting tasks, and then we'll we'll often do a workshop on like a specific skill that you might need in the garden or even just we've done workshops or I've led workshops on like urban ecology and permaculture like more like broad Mm -hmm. scope kind of gardening related fields and then we'll like basically share the harvest so yeah I think like access to food is great I I think a lot just like having access to green space and there are of course parks nearby and you know we're right next to the Mount Royal which is a pretty large probably you know the largest green space in Montreal but people have like constantly told me how meaningful it is for them to sit in a I guess more secluded spot with like a lot of flowers there's a lot of bees there's a lot of like other types of insects and Mm -hmm. I think it's a really really beautiful 
garden. <laughs> I mean, I'm biased, but I, I do think it's a really beautiful garden. I plant a lot of flowers in the garden. And so a lot of folks will just come and like have their morning coffee in the garden. It seems to have been like hugely impactful for people's mental health and just having like a kind of sanctuary, I'd say. And people will, I'll, I'll often just walk by and see people just, there's like a little bench and a little table. And I'll, I'll just see people who I've never even seen before just sitting by the table, like reading a book. So, you know, just having this natural area, I think is is super beneficial. And then I'd say a lot of folks have also been, I think another huge benefit to the garden is is the way that it's been able to foster community between people. I think actually that might be one of the biggest ones because I've I've just noticed so many people become friends in the garden and the the gardeners are are super diverse in age and ethnicity and just like there's been so many cross-cultural intergenerational connections that have been made and mm -hmm. yeah, I just I've just noticed folks like making friends and and really appreciating the community that's come with the garden and just really looking forward to like coming to the garden, not only to get that food, but to like talk to people. And I think, I mean, it's like a bit long, but maybe a long, longer time since the onset of like lockdown, pandemic lockdowns. But I think people still kind of feel that loneliness and coming to the garden yeah. and out, outdoor environment, especially if you are immunocompromised, it's just a very accessible and like, lovely space to connect I guess there's also just the benefit of like learning how to garden that's like a really lovely emphasis or something that I really appreciate it, appreciate about the collective garden is that yeah it was like the community garden community gardens are great as well I just according to collective garden so I like to <laughs> you know no, talk no, but... about why they're so comparison um, yeah, no, but I, I can see the difference, right? Like, it, it's funny because I misspoke earlier. I called it a community garden, and it's true. Like, it's like, for instance, I, for, for one thing, yeah, if I was going to go put, like, there are there are community gardens with, you know, the individual plots in, in Montreal. You see those a lot. But it, it it is true. Like, this collective thing is very unique. If, if I wanted to have a community garden plot, I would there would be a long waiting list. And then the other thing is, like, for me personally, I can come down and help out with the collective garden for a few days learn a lot about gardening, learn a bit about where the food comes from, get to meet and talk with people. And it's a collaborative process. I don't personally have the time or, or <laughs> to like hold my own plot for like a year and just dedicate the time every week to doing that. So I can participate to the level that I want, but yes. without necessarily needing to like, uh, you know, that ownership on the one hand is like, I, I get why people would be like, oh, I want my own plot. I can grow exactly what I want. But it's like, no, there's a freedom to being able to just show up, help, meet some people, learn some things, be a part totally. of it. Yeah. yeah. You leave for a couple of weeks in the summer and it's not like your garden just gets overrun by weeds and all the produce is like falling to the ground and is rotting, right? Like you can yeah. really, such a accessible model for gardening and for accessing fresh food in, in the summer months. And I think the other thing about the community garden plot is, yeah, people wait like five years in Montreal sometimes to get a plot. And not everyone necessarily has the knowledge or about how to garden. So I, I really think that I really enjoy, I think I really enjoy sharing that knowledge. And, and I think that's another really big benefit to folks is that they just kind of get a greener thumb and, and learn yeah. how to take care of, of food producing plants and can take that knowledge and then I, especially last year, you know, I, we always have extra seedlings. Folks take a tomato plant home and grow it on their balcony and like, you know, report yeah. back. And so, yeah, they can just kind of take the knowledge they've learned and then apply it to their own homes or or balconies or whatever. So I think that's another really great benefit. But yeah, I, it truly, I love gardening and I love urban agriculture because, and just agriculture generally, but especially like the collective garden and urban agriculture, because it really touches, it really touches every aspect of your wellness. Like it impacts your like social well-being, your mental well-being, and then your physical well-being. Mm -hmm. Of course, people like even in the garden, you're like active, you know, you're, it's also a very accessible way to stay active and, and yeah. you can kind of take it as far as you want sometimes there's like really arduous gardening tasks like digging really big holes or spreading wood chips or whatever sometimes yeah. it's just like 
you're walking around, you're you're wheelbarrowing some soil, whatever. So I and of course the physical benefits of like getting fresh produce that is you know organic and that you've basically grown yourself. Well, and it's kind of incredible, actually. You're, you're describing like how people are using this to subsidize, you know, their food basically that they're bringing in. For see a future in a lot of cities, you could you would not need that many of these gardens actually to offset a lot of the the importation of food into the city and to help give people a way to grow their own food. Like it doesn't seem like, and not not necessarily saying you could make the entire city self sufficient that way, but uh, well, maybe you could. I don't know, but uh, you know that that would be it, you can do a lot of good. It seems with this model. I think people really underestimate the power of urban agriculture or just like, I think there's like different, I actually don't know the like studies, the research that's gone into it, but I, I know there's kind of like mixed messaging and mixed understandings of like what the impact of urban agriculture and, but it really, yeah, it tangibly has affected the food security of the people that have been attending the collective garden in Milton mm -hmm. Park. And so I, that is like my firsthand account. And, you know, I also have a garden at my parents' place where I lived for like the first 21 years of my life and yeah. that significantly impacted our produce needs as well. And that's, yeah, I, I really do agree. I think that's just in the 30 foot by like 40 foot space that we have, but there are so many, especially in more of the suburbs and even not that far out of this of like the downtown core yeah. like lawns there's so much lawn space that's how much we can produce in you know that 30 feet by 40 feet which is like an average suburban lawn not, it's not even like every house's lawn would have to be converted into some collective garden right because our collective yeah. garden is 15 to 30 folks so i do think it yeah people really underestimate the potential of, of urban agriculture to actually like affect your food security and in like in tandem with like peri urban agriculture and also just like non urban agriculture, it's just like such an important supplement that really will impact people's food sovereignty. And I guess also the dis to distinguish like the food sovereignty aspect of the collective garden, I also really appreciate. So you know, there's obviously like there's obviously the impacts of, of people having access to produce during the summer months. Mm -hmm. But the fact that people in the collective garden also are very like democratically involved in the growing of the food and are yeah. making decisions directly about what kind of what we're growing and like how we're sharing it. And I think that aspect of, of growing our own food is, is hard to like, transpose on larger agricultural models so yeah. i just think it's like a really lovely supplement to the other ways of food production like industrial food production that we're kind of more accustomed to well and it is something like and this is it's funny because talking about newfoundland and, and labrador where i'm from right like people used to kind of grow their own food wherever they could because the the soil sometimes isn't the best for it but you would grow it along the edge of the highway or whatever and naturally a lot of those practices there's been a lot of research in this now because a lot of those practices kind of got removed over time because there was this move towards oh well you know you need to be buying your your food from the store and everything's going to be centralized actually no a lot of those original community practices were really good the the entire island has like a food sh shortage problem if there's ever like a cutoff right there's only like i think a few days of food on the island for for everybody and yeah. the moving back to those sort of actual traditional practices it's not that you're changing things in a huge way you're actually bringing back i'm also just thinking about all the in montreal too like there's lots of because you have a rooftop garden section as well like there's a lot of air space there in the city yeah isn't used for anything as far as i know like rooftops are just not used for basically anything but being rooftops totally there's so much to touch on there i think you're totally right about there just being this forced scarcity and a big part of the lack of green space and i think you you sent me some of the questions and this is one of the main challenges of urban agriculture or the main barriers is just the policy makers like gatekeeping yeah. of of land and of of you know 
sovereignty. Like in Montreal, most neighborhoods, it's illegal to keep chickens, to keep quails. That's not the case in a lot of cities. Like in Los Angeles, for instance, it's 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 legal in like just outside of Montreal, it's legal. And there's even some boroughs in Montreal where it, it is legal to to have chickens. People have stables, um, chickens like are... near downtown Los Angeles. Yeah. There are there are stables with horses in them, so it's still exactly. it's still pretty allowed. And that's, yeah, and that's, that's not the super... easiest city for zoning laws to begin with, no. but they seem to be okay with with that's that kind it. of stuff. And so you know that's a huge barrier to having like uh, food security in an urban environment is the fact that those types of it's it's literally made illegal to have you know chickens, which is a, a amazing source of of yep. protein through eggs and eggs are expensive me and my roommates go through like a carton every two or three days because i live with three other folks so you know okay, still yeah. but for a family that's it's still quite a lot and yeah. also the egg industry is, is pretty exploitative and and harmful so it's always nice to get farm fresh eggs and the same thing in montreal there are not like there are other unused green spaces in the milton park neighborhood i'm thinking specifically of this this nunnery in the neighborhood that has been decommissioned and is now kind of being made open to the public. And they have an enormous, okay. enormous, it's about an acre of of land that was an apple orchard when the nuns used to farm there in like the early 1900s. And currently no one, well, there is one organization that has a tiny, tiny little bit of land there to garden, but like that is an acre of, of arable farmable land, like in the downtown yeah. Montreal. And I've, I've asked consecutively for three years, if I got to have some space there to grow food. And I'm, I'm always turned down for di- different bureaucratic reasons that I think are kind of excuses. But so that is like just a, an enormous barrier is like the policy and bureaucracy and yeah, the yeah. like aspects and I think you know even in my neighborhood where my where I grew up like my parents neighborhood is a bit more of an affluent neighborhood it technically I think is written in the bylaws that like the lawn has to like be like Mm. presentable you know like and no one really enforces that my neighbors actually well like my parents neighbors were were super fond of the garden and always stopping to talk about it but I completely converted their lawn like there is no there's very little lawn space left. So that is in a, maybe a more stringent borough that would also could also be like deemed illegal. So mm-hmm. there are full on like barriers to that end as well. And then you had a, a second part that I, I forgot what I was going to say about it. <laughs> well, I was just thinking about what you just said about the, the, like the lawn and the, the rules around that kind of stuff, because that, that also ties into what happened in, in Newfoundland and Labrador in a sense that became, again, it was like, well, you don't grow your own food because it's not the, to a certain extent, the fashionable thing to do as well. Like it was like, oh, well, no, yeah, you, you don't want to be seen as the person growing turnips in your backyard, even if that's a really good idea. And personally, yeah. I, I would rather see a garden full of stuff than like that. And like, there's a lot of people who, you know, they, they're always working on something in their yard. They've got lots of, of stuff to, to this day that they're doing. I much rather see that, you know, and they're reusing things, you know, whatever they, they may be than yeah. like just a lawn full of very useless, maybe semi pretty grass, right? Like it, it's always a yeah. weird thing. I think yeah. that- I think that tides are kind of turning. You're totally right. Like I think for a long time and the lawn itself is like very much a colonial construct that was just meant to be the sort of status symbol because there's all these like English gardens with their like perfectly manicured lawn. And, you know, that also people still kind of hold on to that, like that they have to have this the perfect lawn in their neighborhood. Yeah. But I I do think that things are definitely shifting and and people are are starting to like let go of the lawn yeah. uh, or at least the, maybe I'm also in my own like tunnel of folks I come to the collective garden and love it but you know even in my parents neighborhood where the lawn's a little more important maybe they don't want that for that lawn for their lawn but they're super supportive of the kind of recycled makeshift garden that honestly for a long time wasn't that attractive I like now I actually really focus as well on making the garden more like my the gardens that I design more aesthetically pleasing <laughs> because I do think that it's just like a beautiful space to be in and it also makes people maybe it's appreciate them a little more I it's hard to find someone who doesn't like collective gardens but when they're when they are there and they do exist having it like even be more aesthetically pleasing and more organized I think is always like very encouraging 
And I also wanted to, now I remembered what I was going to respond to, which was the rooftop garden aspect. Yeah, um, yeah. Which it, I am partial to in-ground gardens because I just don't have success, as much success in growing like in containers. Like I, I it's just trickier. Like they, plants really appreciate in my experience like tabbing into the subsoil and they're able mm. to access water a little bit easier like the rooftop you kind of have to get a sprinkler or an irrigation system or like consistent watering schedule and you have to bring up all the soil and it's more expensive and has more of an impact an ecological impact just to like create the infrastructure sometimes because you have to bring up all those materials in order to create it make sure the soil like isn't draining into like the gutter which has happened at the, the Milton Park Citizens Committee rooftop yeah. garden and the other benefit to me of the in-ground garden is that it really like heals the soil microbiome and mm. in our garden you know it's the collective garden that's in ground started just as a grassy lawn and we dug swales which are kind of like trenches along the sides of the raised beds um and then use that soil to fill up the raised beds and then filled those like ditches with wood chips. And now when you dig into the soil in that space, it is so rich with earthworms and like the soil is just a beautiful dark color. So I really love the in-ground garden, mm. but the roof, you're totally right. That rooftops are like, a, I think a really big kind of talking point now in urban agriculture because they are just unused. And even if it's not growing food per se, green roofs do offset like yeah. the heat island effect. And it's just like a great space to, if you live in a building that has a green roof, it's just nice to be able to access like greenery. And I do think it also just, yeah, impacts the carbon offset of the building anyway. But I, and or yeah, you have pollinators totally... or it's helping to cycle yeah. the air through and reduce air pollution in the city. There's exactly. there's all these things that seem to be like pretty obvious benefits, as you say, maybe not having like a totally productive rooftop, but at least having something up there that's not. Um... And like one of the key urban agriculture institutions in Montreal is Centre Paul Roulon. They have a, a rooftop garden and there's a super productive. So it's maybe you just need like more, you know, knowledge and, and work, but it's also a totally viable like food sec food security solution in urban environments. I just I just struggle with them. So you know, I'm an in-ground gardening kind of kind of girl i think <laughs> I, well, I want to and touch you... on something you said oh go ahead yeah no 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 go for it i want to touch on something you said earlier which is kind of the the summer that we just had and i mean obviously there, there were a lot of forest fires and uh that impacted montreal in fact i remember being near milton park on one of the days that it was really bad the 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 smoke in in montreal i mean you could kind of just see the sun as like this faint circle right through through the smoke and you mentioned that actually affects the growing season in the urban space. That's something that I've not heard before. And I'm curious just what the like what those sort of impacts are or how those those sort of things might be more common in the future. Yeah, I'm not sure how much it was just the smoke. It was also like a cooler summer and then kind of warm in May, but then it cooled off a lot for June, July. But mm -hmm. smoke just made the conditions cooler generally and just mm -hmm. blocked the sun for a couple of days so a lot of plants i noticed like the tomatoes took a really long time to ripen like like sometimes like upwards of almost a month and really? just didn't grow that well because they lacked heat and they lacked sun and also we had to co cancel two collective gardening sessions because of the smoke um because it was literally dangerous to be outside and i think all we're all kind of reeling from that because most of us have never experienced that level of of like smokiness or smog uh which is an enormous privilege but that was definitely like a first experience for a lot of us so yeah we we couldn't actually garden for like a couple of i guess weeks because we only meet normally once a week i go like more regularly to the garden but still impacted it yeah i don't know how much of it was also just the rest of the season or also just you know maybe i 
maybe I did some mistakes when I planted as well. I planted things really close last year. Maybe that was on me. But I I did notice that, you know, the, the blocking of the sun was was tricky. Well, as for you sure. say, it takes away that ability to enjoy the garden for people for a lot of that. Like it's because, I mean, it's one of those things that outdoor activities in general were, were impacted by that, the ability for people. And, you know, that can sound again kind of privileged or something but that's actually really important it's something that's harder to do in a city like uh, i've spent a fair amount of my life in mostly rural places and it's easier to get outside and to go do something and if there's a forest fire you're more directly in the path of it and that's a, a huge issue but in general you will spend more of your your life outdoors because that's just kind of there in the city it's like because of the way they're designed to begin with, it's not conducive to getting it out. And for those few times that people do get that ability to get into something outdoors, as you say, all those critical benefits of being in the garden, working with other people, seeing things grow and being able to to have that power over it. I can see how that would be a very disempowering to not be able to do those things. Yeah, totally. And also in a North American climate, you kind of wait like months and months to be able to access outside in a way that's yeah. not restrictive. So it's always so I was so disappointed when, you know, there was multiple days, like probably in total a couple of weeks where you just like couldn't go outside in a way that would be healthy. And to be stuck indoors on, in summer, you wait kind of all year for that. It was, yeah, it's definitely a little heartbreaking. And actually, it's something I'm trying to consider for this growing season because there's been like record low snowfall which mm -hmm. will likely impact forest fires again it's obviously like with climate change these things snowball like it's a is it a positive feedback loop or is mm -hmm. it a negative loop? positive right like it just keeps getting it, it's more. a feedback loop definitely yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's what... so you know that i i am anticipating those like those conditions again if if not possibly worse and just going to try and choose varieties that are like less picky about like conditions maybe just try and stick to like a couple of tried and tested climate resilient varieties giving them more space in the garden giving them more nutrients just trying to make the other conditions that i can control a little bit a little bit more supportive so that if or when we do get those kind of like smoky or whatever drought or any type of climate change consequence condition that maybe they'll be a little bit more mm. supported that's really neat about the the growing things i so i'm curious another thing that i wanted to touch on and you've mentioned this in bits and pieces already there's a lot of other things other initiatives happening in the milton park area so there's a, you know the general milton park citizens committee and they've got a lot of other things how is the garden connected to those things or is it connected or maybe it's just kind of going off and doing its own thing yeah, that's a great question. I mean, Milton Park is a very politicized neighborhood, I'd say, because of sort of this historic struggle in the neighborhood to make the housing into a cooperative land trust. Mm -hmm. So like the quick story is that in the 70s, 60s and 70s, the historic buildings and, and houses in the neighborhood were being bought up in private. And once the citizens of the of this neighborhood found out that their house, in order to be demolished, sorry, I need to add that part, in order to be demolished to make way for these kind of large, brutalist era uh, power things. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they actually succeeded in demolishing a whole street. That's Park Avenue where you actually, it's very ironic, actually, because the garden is on the land of one of those buildings that demolished the homes that the Milton Park Citizens Committee was founded to to fight against yeah. um so that is the little irony of the garden <laughs> you've got the garden and this massive tower next to it of the food of the architecture as you say they got stuck in but yeah exactly yeah and so they bought the citizens basically ended up mobilizing doing sit-ins and with the help uh eventually like we're successful in their mobilization due to a lot of direct action and we're able to with the support of like the municipality the province buy back their housing and, and force this company this real estate company to to sell it basically mm -hmm. back to them and instead of kind of individually owning their homes they made it into a like housing co-op so now it's one of one of the largest or the largest land trust in north america mm -hmm. and the milton park citizens committee was the organization that was founded in 1969 in order to kind of lead that political work and 
the Milton Park Citizens Committee or CCMP for short, has kind of had like a, a long journey, I think, that ha it has had different roles in the community at different times because it's like over 50 years old and mm -hmm. people come and go and momentum builds and recedes. I, I think currently there's a lot of like individual projects happening in the neighborhood and the CCMP is a not-for-profit. And the way I've sort of seen the CCMP work in my past three, four years working with them is almost as like a incubation zone for these types of community led initiatives. So like the, and they've been really supportive um, as like fiduciaries, as like resources to like nurture these like community led initiatives. So there's um, the garden, there's SLAM, which is a in like an autonomous tenants union. And there's commune, which is like in kind of an indigenous led solidarity building houselessness advocacy group um mm. milton park has one of the highest rates of homelessness primarily indigenous folks in the island so there's been like a lot of solidarity organizing there and then there's also just like other kind of movements to democratize these two decommissioned hospitals that are in the neighborhood so there's the hotel dieu hospital which i was talking about with the old nunnery and there's the Royal Vic. Both were decommissioned like fairly recently, maybe 2018, 2019, uh, when they built this kind of super hospital off the highway. If you're a Montrealer, you know about it. So, so those are kind of the other projects that the CCMP has, like, at least in my time, has historically worked on or has helped incubate. And in many ways, the garden is like both an independent, is like kind of independent as a mm -hmm. like almost like working group I'd say but like like the CCMP is almost this like mother not for profit that allows us to like get grants that allows us to use their space for like tool storage and obviously we like maintain their gardens so it is very much a like project of the CCMP but also works very independently yeah if that makes sense and oh, there was, you know, there was also a food bank that the CCMP helped incubate that's now kind of its own independent project. And the garden has, like, the collective garden has given, oh, and then I should mention also that I've been, like, deeply involved in the creation, the founding of a solidarity co-op bar bistro in the neighborhood, which the CCMP has also helped, like, incubate. And there's a lot of overlap as well in the activists that are involved in all these projects, I'd say. So that's our Milton Park Solidarity Cooperative. And the garden has like provided like excess harvest. So, you know, when everyone's kind of done taking the harvest, we often like have leftover. So that has gone sometimes to the food bank. Sometimes we'll bring it to Bar Milton Park. Um, and then just like, you know, people who frequent the bar, or who frequent the food bank, we'll just take that extra harvest. I think like collaboration and more like cohesion or fusion between the different groups is something I want to focus a little bit more on in the garden. I think for mm -hmm. the past two years, it's been maybe just because it was a new project and you just kind of need to like get the ground. Get sort of development phase to get to, to get to, yeah. Exactly. It's just kind of focusing on like making the garden exist and maintaining it, but it's definitely something I feel like I'd like to focus a little bit more on is just politicizing the garden a little bit more and integrating it within the very like political history of the Milton Park Citizens Committee. Because most people, to be honest, <laughs> come to the garden, don't know about the like really rich history of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I think just having it like even, of course, there's the workshops on urban ecology, on permaculture, which I think is like really wonderful popular education but just connecting the gardeners and the garden a little bit more to other struggles that are in the neighborhood and slam and like there have been gardeners who have been like i'm having problems with my landlord and with my housing and i'll like direct them to slam and they'll get in, they'll get involved in the tenants union and vice versa actually like folks at the yeah. tenants union will have meetings in the backyard of the ccmp building fairly often it coincides on gardening days and they've come to the garden to start gardening with us so there's been like definitely like a sharing of of individuals in all these projects but yeah i think that's something that i want to like focus even more on this season 
Yeah, it gives a, a, a space for sharing and engagement with people maybe who wouldn't otherwise become involved because they just happen. I mean, that's the benefit too. Where a sort of common theme in our work over the past year has been a lot on how like digital spaces are super important and how we we want to build those up, but also like there's an uncertainty with them at the moment uh, for a lot of reasons. There's a kind of diversifying those like physical spaces, those physical ways that we bring people together again it has all those benefits as well that you mentioned earlier that you can't get without like a community garden but it also has the fact that people get involved who maybe wouldn't normally get involved for people who are interested in joining the community garden and dropping by and helping out who should they contact what should they do how they how can they support it oh that's a good question um, <laughs> the gardens may be a little bit too word of mouth at the moment. No, that's not true. So we will probably start gardening in in April. And we did just get confirmation like today that the project is being renewed um, because we are kind of at the whim of the administration of the building because they can decide at any point that they want that land back. But they mm. really like the project, which is awesome. And the project has also just been like pure good. It's hard to find things in the world that are just so wholesome and good. And the garden and is everybody honestly, agrees on like <laughs> this honestly, is a good I idea. Think so yeah, yeah, I really think so. I it's hard to find like of any criticism of such a project. And we'll probably start gardening in April. So you can either come by the garden. Um, Saturdays, 1 p.m. is has been historically when we've met, and I think that'll probably could be a consistent time this this season. The gardens on Hutchison and Prince Arthur, um, so those are the, the those are the cross streets. Or I think the best thing to do would be if you have Instagram uh, or Facebook, would be to follow the garden page there, there because that's where I'll I'll post like when we're meeting and you know the when we actually start gardening. So on. Instagram, it's Les Jardins Collectif Milton Park, but I want to confirm that it's either Les Jardins Collectif or just Jardin Collectif Milton Park. And we'll also put um, the links below this podcast too. And it's the same thing on Facebook. It's Les Jardins Collectif Milton Park. Um, and, oh, well, you know what? There's actually two Collective Garden Facebook pages. So I, I'd have to find the right <laughs> one. On Instagram, it's Les, on Instagram, it's Les Jardins Collectif. For, for yeah. those listening, whichever one is linked below the podcast, that's the right one. <laughs> the exactly. the yeah, other one, yeah, maybe exactly. not. Yeah, so those are the, the best social medias because um, I don't have like a garden email or anything. So hopefully you either come in person or check those social medias out. Yeah, you can also just do what I, I've done on the random days I've been there, which is, ah, I was in the neighborhood. I'm going to go see see what's yeah. happening. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's super accessible. You don't need to, like, people are always asking, like, do I need to sign up? Do I need to, like, pay a fee? And it's like, no, just, just show up and help if you'd like or chat. And <laughs> Well, and, like, I, I remember being there one day and somebody just stopped by and gave everybody chocolate bars because they just wanted to give something to the people working in the garden. I was like, okay, fantastic. This is lovely. <laughs> like, the uh, garden brings out the best in people. Like, yeah. folks will, it's, I'm, it's, the garden reflects all the goodness and then also, like, brings out, I think, the, the best in everyone. Yeah. There's a lot of sharing going on. It's, it's really lovely. Uh, this was a lovely discussion. I hope that folks listening enjoyed and and want to get involved in their collective gardens uh wherever they might be located or or come by milton park garden because the, the growing season's almost upon us well or i guess it, once the podcast comes out it will be it, yeah well i mean I, this may be coming out around the time and that's also a great point to just end on is to say this is a model to if you're listening to this you're not in montreal you can't drop by there, there, there are ways to apply this to to your neighbor so maybe i don't know i don't want to say this on your behalf reach out to the facebook page for advice or is that yeah for sure yeah cool. that'd be great i love to talk about the garden so <laughs> i could literally talk another hour about the garden please <laughs> message me about the garden <laughs> tal thanks so much for joining me today thank you so much for having me connor
Hi, everybody. Just jumping in quickly at the end here to do the podcast Q&A for this week's episode. These Q&As aren't in any way related to the podcast interview you just heard. It's just a chance for us to answer your questions as listeners to the podcast and give you some answers to what you need. You can send in your question for the Q&A by emailing us at info at sierraclub.ca. We're happy to take your questions and we're happy to answer them. Just a, a quick reminder again, the answer we're giving here isn't in any way representative of the views of our guests that we had on today, but we hope it's of interest to you. So we had somebody write in to ask, what is the one thing I could do as somebody concerned about the environment that would have the biggest impact? And that's a tricky question because the one thing that you could do uh, to help the environment, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things. If I had to go down to the one specific thing that you can do that has the biggest impact, it's actually probably talking to others about these issues. And we've had the last couple of episodes in the podcast, we've been dealing a lot with the carbon tax, for instance, and carbon pricing. And we've been dispelling a lot of the myths around it and a lot of the things people are hearing and talking about the fact that it doesn't really cost consumers that much at all. It's not a, a big impact on inflation. Most families get more back. And like just simple facts like that, those don't spread by us during a podcast. That that spreads because you talk to other people about those issues. Uh, that information helps people make decisions about what they want to do, you know, what they want to support, what policies they, they think are important. And that's really, really important that people are hearing accurate information because again, we can't be having these discussions about climate policy and which policies we think are good and which policies we think are bad uh, without those facts out there. So if I had to say that there's one number one thing that you can actually do to make a difference for the environment, it would be speaking to other people. Because again, the most convincing thing is not me talking to you over a podcast, the most convincing thing is actually people talking to each other. Not to say that this podcast isn't a great source of information because it is. What's another thing that you can do while well, being, you know, socially and politically active, right? Getting involved with, and it doesn't matter who you support politically, the, the making the decision that whoever you do support, you're going to vote based on the environment, that you're going to talk to the candidates when they come to the door about the environment, that you're going to advocate if you are, a, you know, a member of a party or a political organization or something like that, for the environment to be a top item for them. I think that that's another way that you can help make a difference in a, in a very big sort of way because unfortunately what we are seeing is that a lot of the issues we deal with environmentally are top-down systemic issues that are only really resolved by changes in, in policy by changes in what we support and at the company level too maybe you're a member of a company maybe you're an employee you know getting your company to change the way it it interacts with the environment the way it, it does practices so that they're more sustainable. That's one way you can create systemic change. So that would be my number two item for you would be there. And I think ultimately what you're going to pick between those two is going to come down to or some combination of those two is going to come down to what you have access and the ability to do. We can't do everything individually, but, you know, talking to other people is a very uh, good way to generate change. Organizing people in your community is a step further. It's actually organizing for change. You can do lots of other things for us. We do encourage you to sign up for, for weekly updates from, from us to take action on some of our action items, our petitions. We have tons of digital actions you can take that only take a second. Those are super important as well. There's lots of ways to keep up to date to share content like this podcast and and get that information out there to people that way and to to write in to politicians to engage with your political leaders and representatives uh, again who no matter who they are no matter who they represent to engage with them where they are and tell them what's important to you i think is is another thing that you can do that is easier than it seems like here's the thing if companies are going to go into that room and lobby politicians well, you should be doing exactly the same thing because they should be beholden to you, not some wealthy interest from a big corporation like the oil and gas industry that often pulls a lot of weight. So those are some things you can do. We talked about in this in this podcast episode, we did talk about collective gardening and organizing in a way that's sustainable for your community and helping to make your community more sustainable. And I think one thing that I'll touch on with that is that is super important. Either individual changes you can make or organizing with your community to make community-wide changes like growing more of your food locally, those are important things. 
Are they going to necessarily be the systemic change? No, but they're important things. And as we heard in this podcast, those two things don't need to be separate. So instead of thinking of it as I need to put my resources only into changing my own environmental behavior or only into organizing my community, you can actually think of I'm going to organize within my community so that we then together have more opportunities to make systemic change. I'm going to do things individually so that I can talk to others about these issues so that we can make systemic change. The two should reinforce each other. They shouldn't be things that subtract from, from each other. So if there's one thing that you want to take away from my answer here, and I hope that this is creates more clarity than confusion, if there's one thing you want to take away it's this. Don't get too wrapped up in having to choose only one path forward, but keep your eye on making those systemic changes happen because it is vitally important, not only because we can only make so much change individually and in small groups, but also because it, those systemic changes make it easier for us to organize individually and in small groups to to make the sorts of changes that we can make locally. So thank you again. Uh, I, again, if you want tips on how to talk to others, you know, reach out to us. There's lots of ways. We have to make sure that the compa- the conversations we have with other people on these issues are compassionate, that it take into mind that everybody is concerned about very common things, right? If we're concerned about things like the cost of living, and there's, there's a legitimate reason to be concerned about that, right? But climate change only makes that worse. Environmental destruction only makes that worse. So keeping in mind those things. Again, thank you for writing in with your questions. If you have another question for us, write in to us at info at sierraclub.ca and just put podcast question in the subject line so we know in what you're writing to us about. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Environment in Canada podcast. Before we leave, a reminder, we have tons of petitions, other actions and events and regular news updates you can sign up for on the homepage of our website, sierraclub.ca. You can also find Sierra Club Canada on social media and you can listen to the Environment in Canada podcast on the Harbinger Media Network, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio and YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast also airs on CKUT Broadcast Radio in Montreal, 90.3 FM, bi-weekly on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. ET. Don't forget to click follow or subscribe so you get the latest episodes from us.